We are near the halfway point of the year, which means it's time for the halfway point best and worst books of the year so far. We're starting off with the worst. Next video will be the best. In this video, I have three books to talk about, one that I didn't like, but I didn't hate, one that I hated, and then one that I, um, I, it, it, it made me laugh. It made me laugh because of its ridiculousness. Two of these three books have never actually, I've never talked about them on the channel. Um, so they've been saved for this video. So even if you watch all my videos, you have not heard about some of these books, or at least not from me. You've probably heard of at least one of them. Anyway, but before we get into the video, a shout out to today's sponsor, Book Infinity. I don't think I like reading anymore. What? Why? Haven't you watched the video we're in? I was just talking about their books that I was reading. That You're breaking the fourth wall right now. Tired of getting tons of recommendations from YouTube videos and friends that just don't actually work out because they're not tailored to you? Well, Book Infinity is a website built for readers by readers. They have a personality quiz that matches you with books that align with your specific reader type, and they make it so that finding your next book isn't so hard. Their quiz takes time to know your personality, lifestyle, and reading habits to create an accurate reader type you will be excited to meet and explore. And you get personalized recommendations. You can track the books you like share your reactions with a unique review system based on mood, and create custom lists of books that you can share with your friends. The quiz was full of fun types of questions, but then also what I really liked was after I got matched with my personality type, they had a list of all the other types and what kind of books they would be recommended as well, which works out great for me because the type that they categorized me as, they had a lot of really great recommendations for, but then also I'm going to the beach in a few weeks and I can just easily check out what a beach reader type would want and flip through those so that I can have beachy reads. So it's actually, it's, it's got a lot of really great recommendations to it. I've really enjoyed looking through the website. I'm really enjoying getting all these different recommendations, stuff that I'm not seeing on booktube, not seeing other people in my circles and groups reading. So I'm getting a wider range of recommendations. So check out Bookfinity to take your reader quiz and get specific specialized recommendations for you. All the information is in the description of this video. First book on the list is one that I have talked about. I talked about it in a wrap up a couple of months ago, but I'm gonna talk about it again just in case you missed that. It's called This Close to Okay. This book I didn't necessarily hate. I just didn't like it, uh, but the ending redeemed it just the tiniest little bit. So for this one, I will mostly be talking spoiler free, but you know, I will be giving some details about it. So if you're super sensitive to spoilers, probably just this video isn't the one for you but then I'll also dip into spoilers a little bit there at the end. There are timestamps for each of these books and for the spoiler sections, so you're free to skip around. This close to okay. Um, the setup of this book, we follow two characters. One's name is Tally. She's a licensed therapist. And then one whose name isn't revealed until a little bit, she in her mind calls him Bridge. The reason she calls him Bridge is because this book opens with him getting ready to jump off a bridge and she stops to save him, to stop him, to talk him down. So she does, she talks him down and then she invites him to a coffee shop because she's trying to be careful because she doesn't know him. She doesn't know anything about him. So she wants to meet in a public area, but she also wants to see if she can try to help him in some way. Sounds great. <laughs> then after a very short coffee shop talk, she invites him to her house, then she invites him to spend the night, then she invites him to, invites him to spend many, many nights. So the whole I'll be cautious thing, it's just kind of, we, we, we only did that for a minute. Throughout this book, Tally, in her perspective, has these italicized thoughts over and over and over again throughout the entire book where she calls herself her, his unofficial therapist. And she has these thoughts like patient copes in this way. Patient is inherently kind. Patient, this, that, and that. And she's, she's treating him in her mind like a patient. And she's trying to assess and diagnose him throughout every encounter they have. Did I mention this is a romance? Oh, and did I also mention that she never tells him that she's a licensed therapist or that she considers him her unofficial patient? She omits all that information, makes up a fake career for herself, and develops this relationship with this fella. 
I just feel like if we wanted, if we wanted this book to center around a relationship between two people, which it does, it wouldn't have been that difficult to make it not immediately very uncomfortable. She could have just disclosed that she was a therapist. She could just not think of herself as, uh, as his therapist. And then the relationship between them would have instantly been less awful to read about. But don't worry, he's horrible too. He also makes terrible choices that affect her life in very significant ways and keeps those things from her while entering into this relationship. So just in general, we're having a great time with two people who are very bad at this relationship. The plot itself is a bit wild at times. There, there are definitely some scenes that I'm like, oh, okay, we're doing this now. Someone's gonna just be set on fire during a party. It's fine, everything's fine. There are definitely some wild moments in this book, but for the most part, it's it's two people having conversations in different locations and a lot of talk around mental health and um, just, it's it's a very slow, I feel like this book, I said this in the, in the wrap up, I feel like this book is trying to be a combination between literary fiction and romance. And I'm not sure, I enjoyed either side of, of that attempt. Um, the literary fiction side of it, some of the conversations we were having, some of the discussions the characters had with each other were interesting and good and, and there were some really great lines in this book, but then there were some things that I just don't really, I don't, I don't love. Um, but the thing that, that just, <laughs> The nitpick I have that bothered me throughout this whole book is the writing style. Uh, I'll read to you a couple of lines. He never drank wine anymore. It silked down his throat like a ribbon. She flinched, her words clomping out with sticky boots. She was buzzed like him. They were two tiny bees touching antennae, buzzing. He wrapped his hand around hers, the pales of the wrist kissed. Tally counted to three. He put up a decent fight. My pleasure, he said modest as fresh cut green grass. He and Tally finished their plump little beers. Anyway, um, there, there were just so many lines in here, so many similes, like being modest as fresh, fresh cut green grass. I'm just not really sure how modesty and green grass, fresh cut grass, go together. There were so many lines in here that just read really awkward to me, like it was trying to be poetic, but, not knowing how. And um, the the thing is that this is a split POV. We're in his perspective and her, we're in his head and her head throughout the book. And these lines are present in both of their perspectives. So it's not even like one of the characters is just very poetically minded or really wants to be. It's that the whole book is written like this. And I just, it just, I don't like that it's it's not at the very least exclusive to one character so that I can just say this is that character's personality. It's just the book. The book is this way and it doesn't work for me because these lines read so awkward and not actually poetic. But anyway, let's get back to the plot. Um, as I said, the male perspective, Bridge, is he makes choices. She makes terrible choices. He makes terrible -er choices somehow. Jumping into spoilers really briefly, he used the timestamps, skip around. Don't get spoiled if you don't want to. But at one point they get drunk together and he, or he gets drunk alone, I don't actually remember. I think it was together. And she goes to bed and he goes on her computer and he makes a fake email and then emails her ex-husband who cheated on her and left her for for his new family. And she's broken up over it and it's really hard for her naturally. So he, creates a fake email, emails her ex-husband and says, hey, it's Tally, this is my new email, let's talk. And then he begins, he begins drunkenly a conversation with her ex in her name, but then continues for days on afterwards, soberly having this ongoing conversation with her ex. He'll have conversations with her She'll reveal really intimate insecurities and fears that have developed over this cheating and divorce. And, and then he'll repeat those things back to the ex in email form, in her name, even though she has no intention to ever have these conversations with her ex, he's having them pretending to be her. 
for a while this goes on. And they start a romance while he's doing this. What are you doing, man? How stupid do you have to be? And I do think that he's forgiven too easily for this. When she finds it all out, she's upset, but she just gets over it. And I'm just not cool with that. Anyway, continuing on with spoilers, he does end up, I mean, they do end up not together. They uh, separate ways and lose contact, I'm pretty sure. And then they end up coming back together, meeting again, and it's implied that they've both moved on, they don't get back together, they see each other again as friends. And I at least like that because this relationship is broken. If it ended as a true romance, I don't know what I could have done with myself, but I do like that it ended there where if they were two people in bad head spaces, in bad places, making bad choices, and they were in each other's lives for a moment, and then they are no longer in each other's lives. And I like that ending. However, what, what were we even doing in this book? I don't really know. Anyway, it didn't work for me. Uh, back to spoiler free basically nothing but the very very ending worked for me there were a couple of there were a couple of lines that I do actually think were really good but for the most part didn't work now we're on to the two books that have never been discussed by me on the channel uh, starting with survive the night this is a book that a lot of people haven't liked I fall into that camp I read this with some of my friends we all read it together and oh oh it was it was messy it was a mess um, so the plot line of this is we follow this girl, Charlie. Oh, her name is burned into my head because... <laughs> okay, so Charlie, um, there's this campus killer on her college campus who is picking off girls and killing them. And uh, Charlie's roommate was one of those girls. And uh, Charlie is devastated. She's obviously, like, that, that, that affected her. She decides that she needs to go, she needs to travel from point A to point B, and it's going to be a long car trip. She must leave now. She can't wait on her boyfriend, Robbie. So, in, so in, she decides to go to the bulletin board where somebody posts, a man posts, that he is traveling in that direction and, you know, carpool. And so she agrees upon it agrees to it. Already we have a campus killer who's picking off girls and she decides to get into the car with a stranger. Immediate red flags where he's answering questions wrong and revealing that he's not actually, he doesn't belong on this campus, he's not actually a student. She asks him questions and she trips him up and catches him in lies and she still gets into the car with him and I don't know, man. Anyway, we're in her head and in her head she's saying, I'm gonna be extra cautious, I'm gonna be extra careful. I have to be, I have to be like a maiden in a, in a movie. Oh my goodness, this girl likes movies. I have to be like the girls in the movies who are strong and brave and cunning and and, and I don't remember all the adjectives she used, but she described the girls in the movies that she wants to be like, and she's gonna be like them too, and she's going to be on her toes. She repeat just over and over and over again, she tells us that she is aware of her surroundings and she's making good choices as she continues to make bad choices, like getting in the dang car with the guy. Or when she's like, maybe I should have checked his license plate to see if it was even a, a license plate for this state. Didn't do that. Never check the license plate. And then like red flag after red flag after red flag is coming up with this guy. And she will have these spiraling thoughts of, oh no, I need to get out of this car. I gotta jump, I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta jump out of the car as, as he slows down at this toll booth. I have to do this. And she'll have these thoughts where she just repeats herself over and over and over again. I don't know, maybe to add more pages to the book. I don't know why she does this. But just over and over again, she'll keep saying the same thing and then we get to the moment where she can escape and then he'll say something interesting. And she's like, wait, I need to know what he means. And then she'll stay in the car. Again and again and again. That's like the whole first half of this book is just her saying, I must escape. I don't trust him. Escape. I must escape. I don't trust him. And then he says something off the wall and she's like, and I, I don't know what that means. And it's not interesting. It's, it's this really, we're stuck in a car. We're in the same place for the first half of this book. We're just stuck in the same place with these two people and nothing is really changing. We just have these, we're just in Charlie's head while she compares everything to a movie and she wishes she was in a movie and she, and she repeats the same stuff over and over again and nothing happens. Anyway, this is one of those rare books where it's terribly boring and then whenever things start happening, it gets worse. 
<laughs> so, so, oh, it's just, it's a mess. Now we're gonna get into some mild spoilers. I still won't say anything huge, but more details, I guess. When things start happening, it's just off the wall. It's not cohesive. It doesn't make sense. And like big glaring plot holes. Stuff like we switch POVs and go into other people's heads. And then we hear in that person's head them saying they want to help Charlie or saying something very specific and Charlie, and then and then we get the big twist and it turns out that they were against her this whole time. And it's like, you can't, you can't place me in someone's head and have them say something very deliberate and it turns out that you were lying. Because it's you that's lying, not them. Because I was in their head. They had no reason to lie to themselves. They, they weren't speaking out loud. They were having an inner monologue saying, I wanna help her, and then they don't. And in fact, it's the opposite. That's a lie from the author, not a lie from the character. Stuff like frail, sickly old people having way too much strength and being able to like wrestle down our main character, our main character making every wrong choice she possibly could. Stuff like our main character, uh, she can't escape, she has the chance to, she will, but then she just abruptly, randomly, for no good reason, decides I'm gonna be a femme fatale. I'm going to get back in that car, even though I can totally leave right now. I'm gonna get back in that car and I'm going to take him down despite having no experience and no reason to think that I can because now, now, I'm, now I'm different because I said so. I mean, it just every, 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 every corner. And, and you know what is worse is my friends and I, we were reading this together. We were discussing it at the end of every chapter and we were throwing out these comedically bad potential endings, just like laughing, what if the book went here? And that is how it went. We called it jokingly. Let's get into spoilers. Use the, use, use the, the timestamps of the description to skip over the spoiler part if you wanna read this book, because I'm doing spoilers right now. So Charlie, throughout this entire book, compares everything to a movie and brings up movies around every opportunity she possibly has. And she also regularly slips into what is essentially just a very overactive imagination where she has these movies in her mind, which is kind of like a lucid daydream. And she sees things that aren't there and then snaps back to reality. And really early on, we were like, oh no. <laughs> This is all a movie in her mind. Basically, the equivalent of it was all just a dream. And we also called the killer, but that was because everything was off the wall and why not? But anyway, I just, I think that things like being in Marge's perspective and Marge saying I'm gonna help Charlie and then actually having hired Josh to bring Charlie to her so that she could torture her for information it's like that doesn't work because we're in her perspective listening to her thoughts and her thoughts are lying to us only so only to throw off the reader stuff like marge having superhuman strength when she is old and frail and has stage 4 cancer but she can wrestle charlie to the ground it's just it's so it's so lazy because this it was all a movie and in fact this is a true story this did happen to charlie but we're watching the embellished side of it we're watching the movie playback where some things have been exaggerated to make it more theatrical and it's like to me that just feels like such a cop out where you have these glaring flaws in the story that make it not make sense but then you can just throw this caveat on here where that says yeah but it was all embellished and, and it's and, and then we the readers just have to be like oh so these things that didn't make sense they're here because it was a movie and not a book and movies make less sense is that is that the moral we're supposed to take away movies make less sense so it's okay that this doesn't make sense if this was a book if we were actually following charlie then we'd have to fix these plot holes but since it's a movie we don't have to fix the plot holes is that is that what we're supposed to take away from this book also charlie married her kidnapper Josh really actually did in real life kidnap her. Josh actually in real life was hired to bring her to someone to torture her and potentially kill her to get information from her. Josh in real life did these things that wasn't embellished for the movie and she married her kidnapper. And Charlie is already a terribly frustrating 
female POV. She is horribly annoying to follow. Um, but then we also have to have this for her character arc and I just didn't need it. I just didn't need it. Anyway, back to spoiler free. It was just messy. It was just a really messy book. And it seems like a lot of people don't like this book, even huge fans of this author's work. So I'm not discounting the author. I might try another one of his books. I actually read Final Girls several years ago and I really enjoyed it until the end. I didn't like the ending. And then this book I didn't enjoy at all the whole way through. And then the ending was just murder to me. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I still might try another, another of his books, but it does seem like even his fans, a lot of his fans aren't enjoying this one. So, you know, I'm not saying anything innovative or new, but also this book was really bad. Final book. This one I uh, also haven't talked about on the channel and that's because it was a DNF. I did not finish. I did not finish this book. Um, I actually was enjoying it because of how ridiculous it was, but not in the annoying way where it's trying to take itself seriously. Like Survive the Night is trying to be really twisty and turny and surprising and cool and fun. And this one is like, I feel like it was very self-aware and knew what it was doing and it knew it was being ridiculous. Um, but I don't know, it, it was it was so, ridiculous, but in, in a funny kind of way. But I ended up not finishing it just because I lost interest. It is called, let me see if I can get there. I had it on ebook, so now I have to sift through my ebooks and find it. River of Shadows. So this is a dark, um, I don't actually know how to describe this book. It, our main character, uh, goes to her father's funeral, her father her father dies, and she doesn't have, she has a good relationship with him, but she doesn't have a close relationship with him, but she wants to go to his funeral. She goes to, uh, to attend his funeral and then quickly learns that, um, mm, I don't remember what he's called. So anyway, very quickly, she ends up going down to the underworld to try to rescue him, to try to bring him back. She ends up agreeing to being the bride of death and it's a romance. So, you know, it's also, there's some good in there. There's some bad in there. It is what it is. And, um, <laughs> It was just really funny. It's not my type of book. I would have quit on it way sooner if it weren't so funny. This video is long enough already with me ranting about two properly, two books that I properly didn't enjoy. So I'm just going to leave you on this happy note with two hilarious things to me from this book, but it's littered with funny stuff, with over the top ridiculous stuff. But two really funny things. One is that death you know, the the one who rules the underworld, the, the baddie that we are forced into marriage with and who is generally supposed to be intimidating. He rides on a skeleton unicorn. That's his favorite mode of transport and his his right-hand men also ride on a skeleton unicorn. They're, they're, they're called zombicorns. Yeah, I really appreciated that one, zombicorns. Also, there's this whole scene, do I need to, do I need to read it to you or should I, I'll just describe it to you. There's this whole scene. Oh, okay, some, some, some backdrop here. There's this mermaid in this world that, uh, that had a relationship with death a while ago and he ended up keeping her um, because they, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous story, really. But anyway, he ended up keeping her kind of as a captive, not kind of, as a captive. But he decided to keep her in a fish tank to make it more convenient for him, so he, he minimized her, so now she's like the size of a doll. So she is kept in a fish tank in our main character's bedroom as a doll-sized mermaid. She wants to be set free, so she creates this plan with our character to be set free <laughs> by taking her to the tallest tower during a certain time, during a certain moon cycle, and yeeting her out the window. The word yeet was used in this scene about seven times, and it made me laugh every time. So the mermaid says, just carry me to the top of the tower and yeet me out the window. So our main character, the mermaid reaches up her arms to be picked up by our character and, and she, I don't remember her name, and she doesn't want to because this shrunken mermaid is odd to her. So she gets out a boot and she tells the mermaid to crawl into her boot. So she carries her boot up to the highest tower and because she doesn't want to touch the mermaid, she yeets the mermaid out the window in her boot, or she keeps the boot, she just like 
does this and holds onto the boot and the mermaid just flings out the window and that's how it's set free. And that's in the book. That's a whole scene. That is a whole plot point in this story. I never saw how it all comes together and how our character gets in trouble for doing a thing she shouldn't have done to Death's toy. But um, that is a thing that happened in this book and it brought me so much joy. Anyway, those are some books that, uh, two books that I didn't like, one book that I, it was comedically bad, but I feel like it was self-aware. So we're all just having a good time here. My next video is going to be very positive. It's going to be a much longer list full of books that I thought were excellent that I read in the first half of the year. So be looking out for that if you like. Check out my Patreon if you want to. We have a lot of fun there. We have buddy reads, we have movie nights. We, I mean, I'm I'm just there all the time. We just hang out and talk and have a good time. I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I post vlog videos on Thursdays. I'll have that linked in the description if you want to check that out. I'll see you again soon. Bye.